may be seated. Preaching text today is from the epistle lesson, verse 17, or actually verse 18. For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Would you bow me as you pray? Father, help us to understand what it means to be an enemy and what it means to be a friend of the cross of Christ. Help us, Lord, to evermore be those who can call themselves disciples and people of the cross of Christ. Help us to see what, how precious the cross is and what it is all about for us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it was 60 or 62 A.D. that this man that we call Paul, who was originally known as Saul because he was from the tribe of Benjamin, and he was named after the most famous man from the tribe of Benjamin, the original king of Israel, Saul, that later on his name would be changed as he became an apostle to the non-Jews, and he took upon himself a non-Jewish name, Paul. And it's 60 or 62 A.D. that he is writing this letter from a jail in Rome. It's interesting, he mentions that he was imprisoned often. In the book of First Clement, a book that's written after the New Testament, the writer says that Paul was imprisoned seven times. Now, we don't know if that's absolutely true. The book of Acts says he was imprisoned at least three times, and Paul said in prison often, so it probably was more than three, so it's likely it could have been seven times. But he's writing... Most likely, it seems, from Rome, because he mentions the imperial guard and other things that point to the Roman imprisonment that took place in that period. It was there he was awaiting his final execution, where he would be beheaded. And uh, Paul was blessed in that way, right? Because he was a Roman citizen. And if you were a Roman citizen, one thing you did not have to do is if you were condemned to death, you did not have to suffer the indignity of a, of a shameful and agonizing death of the cross. You were ensured a swift, quick execution. And Paul got that. He was beheaded. That was a blessing compared to what it was to be crucified. Because remember, we kind of pretty up the crucifixion, but the crucifixion in those days was meant to terrorize people and to keep them in their place from ever daring to question the authority of Rome. And so we pretty it up. We put a loincloth on Jesus. No doubt he probably died like all the rest, stripped completely naked because that was a way of shaming them. Oftentimes as they were hanging on the cross, they lost their bodily functions. They defecated on themselves. They were covered with flies. And it was a nasty, ugly, shameful thing, especially for a Jewish person, to be hung naked on a tree. It was a way of really getting across to people, you don't mess with Rome, you don't mess with our power, you get in line and follow us. But Paul, he didn't die that way, as I said. He was a Roman citizen, and when he finally, the time came for him to die, it was a swift and clean death. They removed his head from the body, and that's how Paul died. But he's there now in Rome, in prison. And he's writing this people, these people as church, in the very first church he founded in Europe, in Macedonia, that's north of Greece, in Philippi. And he's saying to them, I'm thinking about you, and as I think about you, even now I'm crying. We think, oh, this guy's weird. What's he crying about? They're sitting in prison. Uh, as I studied this, one of the commentators pointed out how many times Paul shares his emotions in his letters. And it shows that he was a very emotional person. He wasn't just a very smart guy, which we know that. He was a brilliant person, a, a genius, and a person of the mind. But he also felt these things deeply in his heart. And he felt this so deeply, the thing that he said today, that there are those people out there who live as enemies of the cross. And that caused him to cry as he thought about these people who were living as enemies of the cross. And as I was looking over the passages for this Sunday, I was drawn to the epistle lesson because it is about the cross. And after all, Lent is about the cross. We have right outside in front of the church our cross we put up during Lent. And it's got the purple cloth on it. And it's one of the things we're signifying that during this time we're, we're anticipating and thinking about Good Friday and what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And I thought, well, it would be good to look at this passage and really think today, what is the cross and what does it mean to be a friend of the cross? And what does it mean to be an enemy of the cross? To be someone who's opposing it. Now, one thing we know is he's not saying that they are enemies of the cross, but he's talking about people who seem to be going into the churches and undermining people's trust 
or right relationship with the cross. He gives us a little more information, remember, from our reading today. Verse 19, he says, their destiny is destruction. That kind of begins to tell us a little bit about these people. Because remember, someone said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. That someone was Jesus. He's saying there is a way that leads to death. There is a way that leads to destruction. But narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that, few there be that find that way. Well, that gives us a little bit of a hint. These people are not living in the right way. That's a part of why they're an enemy of the cross. But it goes on. He goes on to say, their God is their stomach. When I study the commentaries, they point out this was Paul's way of talking about their physical selves and the satisfying of physical desires, not just the stomach. It was a way of speaking of the whole of that part of oneself. And you see this in other parts of his letters when he's dealing with people who are involved in sexual sin. He'll say, they say, food for the body, the body for food. Well, he's, he's just saying, they're saying, it's natural. So if it's natural, just do whatever comes natural to you. Just let your desires have way. And he says, their God are these natural desires. Just do whatever you want. And their glory is in their shame. You see, as a Jew, many of the things that the, the pagan people did were shameful to the Jewish people. And he says, these people glory in that shameful behavior. He goes on to say, their mind is on earthly things. You see what's going on here? Is he's saying, there are these people who've got this idea that because salvation is a free gift, that didn't, didn't just live however you want to live. Just do whatever you want to do. Because after all, it's all been paid for. He's paid all of the price. And then therefore, you can just go ahead and you don't have to worry about how you live. You'll be forgiven. Just if you want to do it, just know that there's grace for you and just go ahead and live your life any old way. And Paul says, to take that attitude is to live as an enemy of the cross. It's to live as one who's not living in a mindful way about what exactly it cost Jesus to bring about this free gift of salvation. Perhaps my favorite question and answer in the catechism is the last one. It's number 128, very last one. It says, what does our communion, meaning holy communion that we take, daily require of us? Now, I've mentioned many times the catechism question where it says, what does our baptism require of us? And I know that one by heart, so I can just say it. Our baptism requires that by daily repentance... We renounce all sinful longings and by faith arise to a new life. And what they're saying is, as our being united to Jesus and our being given a new grace and power because of our being connected to Him calls us to live in a new way. To put off the old ways and live the new ways. That's what our baptism requires of us. But what about our communion? Listen to how the answer is, and I don't have to read it because it's a pretty long answer. Our communion requires that we daily keep in remembrance, daily, meaning every day, keep in remembrance the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus. Now think about that. Uh, coming up, uh, we'll be having Monday, Thursday service during Holy Week. If you've never been to that, that's a wonderful service. We have it in the fellowship hall. We share a meal together, have one of my favorite meals, meatloaf, right? And uh, lots of great food and fellowship together. But what we do then, though, is after that we remember that it was on that day when they shared a meal like that and were together as a group that Jesus said, I want you to do something to remember me. And then he takes the bread and he breaks it. What is he doing there? He's signifying what's going to happen to him. His body is going to be broken. And then he takes the cup and he says, this is my blood. It signifies uh, the shedding of his blood on the cross. And so one of the things our communion requires is that we remember, he's wanting us to remember, remember what I did for you. We're kind of pointing to what's going on because we told the kids that boy always remembered what that man did for them by saving him in that boat. But here's what the catechism goes on to say. And that we consider well how hard it was for our Savior to bear our sins and the sins of the whole world. You see what Paul's saying is, is if you can say, well, Jesus forgives me, so now I can live however I want, you're not remembering the, the, the deep, deep cost, the painful, shameful, ugly cost that was paid so that you could be forgiven. 
goes on to say in the Catechism, and to gain eternal salvation for us by offering up His life and shedding His blood. And here's the kicker. And since our sins caused the Lord Jesus the greatest sufferings, yea, bitter death, we should have no pleasure in sin, but earnestly flee and avoid it. You see what he's saying is, is how could you go back to living your old way when you realize that those very things that you're doing now were the things that caused him to go to the cross and to suffer and die? It's your sins that put him on the cross. Your sins are the source of his suffering. Uh, many of us, we just don't even have an idea of that. You know, we, we kind of know what crucifixion is, but we live so far away from it. We, we don't see it like people did in those days. They knew the suffering because the Romans would pin these people up on the roads where people would walk by so that everyone got the message and they all knew that they needed to toe the line. And so people had the picture in their mind all the time. It reminds me of I had, I had this picture. I mean, I knew a little bit about what a car accident is, but it wasn't until a few summers ago when I was outside and all of a sudden I heard this huge crash and I go around the side of the house and I see down at the Ryman's that there's been this terrible accident. There's a cross there now where that accident happened. And I saw the smashed up cars and I went over there and I saw them get the jaws of life. And David Pugh was there and they take the women, woman out of the car. And he's right there, on, right in front of Ryman's stand uh, doing CPR. And I saw that woman die in front of me because of that car accident that I have burned into my memory. The horror and the ugliness and the tragedy and the, the, the pain of a car accident. And now I really, really have a vision of what a car accident's all about. And that's what the people in Paul's day, they knew what crucifixion was all about, everything that Jesus went through. And that was etched into their minds. One of my favorite movies for getting this across is the movie Saving Private Ryan. You know, I had uh, my own idea about D-Day. I didn't really... You know, I, I, I knew people had done this, but it wasn't until I saw that movie and I saw people actually getting off of the boats and going towards the bullets that I have this new profound awe and respect. I know Gene Bresick's dad was there on D-Day. That these people would do that for me. That they would go and they would storm. And, and seriously, we now know that Hitler, this came out just a few months ago, had one of his professors actually begin to catalog all of the Jews in North America for when they took over North America. He literally had plans to come over here. So when they saved us, they saved us. But one of the things in that movie, of course, is the movie begins by a man actually going to the, the graveyard there in France where all these GIs are buried. And uh, through the story, you begin to find out that he's this private Ryan that these people were, they were sent to save. And at the end of the movie, of course, if you've seen it, and it's been out long enough, so I'm going to go ahead and spoil the ending for people who haven't seen it. Close yours if you don't want to hear it. But that man is there at the end, and he turns to his family, and he says, Tell me I've lived a good life, that I've lived an honorable life in light of the sacrifice that was made to give me this life? Did I live a life worthy of all of this death? And, and did I live with that in mind all these years? And, and thinking about the price that was paid that I might have what I have. And who of us can say even as Americans that we have lived uh, the life that we should live in light of the sacrifices of these people? But how much more then should we live for Jesus who suffered all of that, that we might not suffer that for ourselves, but that we might be given eternal life? And Paul says people who don't turn away from their old ways and they continue to live in their sins, they are living as enemies of the cross. They're living as those who are spitting upon the sacrifice that was made for them. And he says that's why he's crying. These people don't know what they're doing by continuing to just be relaxed in their sinfulness. And you think about it, every time we just are, we, we make excuses, well, that's just the way I am. I just use biting words. Well, hey, Jesus died for your biting words. Every one of your biting words are a part of what brought him to the cross. Well, I'm just someone who gets, you know, I have a bad temper. Hey, Jesus died for that. He died for all the various sins of the world. And so that's why the catechism is so great when it says, and since our sins caused the Lord Jesus the greatest sufferings, yea, bitter death, we should have no pleasure in sin, but earnestly flee and avoid it. And being reclaimed by our Savior and Redeemer, we should live 
suffer and die to his honor, so that at all times, and especially in the hour of death, we may cheerfully and confidently say, Lord Jesus, for thee I live, for thee I suffer, for thee I die. Lord Jesus, thine will I be in life and death. Grant me, O Lord, eternal salvation. Amen. Those are some powerful words. You know, the catechism went through several revisions, you know, through the 1800s. This is the 1929 edition, but they never changed that last question and answer because it's so powerfully and I think rightly expresses what our receiving communion should be doing. It should be keeping us an awareness of the sacrifice that was made so that we will live as disciples of the cross, as those who live, suffer, and die for the honor of the one who died for us. So that's the first reason why they were enemies of the cross. But they were also enemies of the cross because they were spurning the cross as the way to know true life. You see, they were thinking, they were still thinking in their minds that in the world as it is, the best way to know full life, because that was the, that's how they were deceived. They were thinking, the best way to know full life is to give in to whatever desires you have. But they weren't understanding the world in which we live because the world in which we live is not the world that was meant to be. Again, go back to the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2. It says of the people in the garden that they were in intimate fellowship with God. And it was out of that intimate fellowship with God that they were to live in the power of God's presence and know the fullness of life that humans are meant to know. But of course, something happens in the story, right? Disobedience happens, and it cuts the fellowship. It's interesting, we're waiting for that day, aren't we, when we'll be given a new transformed body. And Paul will call that new transformed body in 1 Corinthians a spiritual body. But by that, he doesn't mean that we're just going to be spirit. He doesn't mean there's not a, a resurrection of the material. But here's what he means. Here's what a commentary says about that. The spiritual body that we're going to have in the resurrection at the end of time is a body perfectly animated and guided by the Spirit. That's what he means by a spiritual body. Perfectly animated and guided by the Spirit. See, we get a taste of that today. That to the degree that we're being animated and guided by God's presence in our lives, we know the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience gentleness, meekness, and then finally, self-control. Paul will say to Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, Timothy, but of power and love and of self-discipline. You see, it's when you have that spirit in your life that you can actually order your life in the way that it's supposed to go. And Adam and Eve, in that original story about the original possibility, the first humans don't live by that new possibility. They break fellowship, and something happens in Genesis 4. A new character enters the scene. God says to Cain, sin longs to have you, Cain. See, sin is being personified as a person, as a force, as a reality that's now entered the world. There's no sin mentioned in chapters 1 and 2. Not even chapter 3. The force enters the world after humans break fellowship. And he says, now this new force has entered the world and it longs to dominate your life. And then he says to Cain, but you must master it. And that's the human situation. We can no longer say our humanity is neutral. That we can just trust everything that we feel. That you should just act on whatever desires you have. Because a new force has entered the world. A distorted human nature. The Bible calls the flesh. And if you live by the flesh, the Bible says, you die. To live by the flesh is death, Paul says. But to live by the Spirit is life and peace. So the Bible calls us to live our original destiny, original purpose, to live out of the energy and power of God's presence. But if we're not going to live by the, the flesh, that means daily dying to many of the thoughts, the feelings, the desires that we have. And they knew what that meant. The cross was hard, it was ugly, and it was painful. And they knew that what, what the Christians were saying is, if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to sign up for this thing. It's not going to be easy street. It's going to be painful. It's going to be hard. It's going to mean daily death to the old self so that you can live in to the new self. You know, we live in a world that 
more and more people don't have that sense that I should die to what I want to do. And I should instead live for a greater goal and purpose. I thought of that the other day when I saw this headline. It's from the Daily Mail. This is from like two days ago. Till honeymoon do us part? Why more and more newlyweds are choosing to spend time alone after tying the knot by going on a solo moon. Instead of a honeymoon, they go on a solo moon. After exchanging vows, promising till death do us do part, spending time alone may seem like the last thing newlyweds would want to do straight after tying the knot. But an increasing number of brides and grooms are choosing to spend their first few weeks of wedded bliss apart by going on a honeymoon separately. And you think, well, this is crazy. But the whole reason they're doing it is, well, they don't agree on where they want to go. They have different things they like and they enjoy. And that just reminds us of that, that, that human nature is to be self-centered. And that a big part of what marriage is all about is about learning to die to the... Because you're now married to another person, you've got to take their thoughts, their desires, their interests into heart. And you grow and you change and you become a bigger person. But that involves also a dying daily. Luther said the essence of sin is being curved in on yourself. Being self-centered. And a big part of marriage is the discipline and the hard work of becoming other-centered. And it's a painful process. We talk about wedded bliss. Well, that's usually what people experience towards the end of their marriage when they've, when they've grown a lot, really. When I look at people and they've, they've done the hard work, then they enjoy the blessings of all that hard work. But to get there, you have to have the discipline the, the, the struggle of marriage, which is normal and natural because of the world that we live in. We live in a world where no longer are we, by nature, animated and guided by the Spirit of God. When I was a kid, they used to have this um, commercial of trying to help people understand what it was like to have asthma. Because, you know, when you have asthma, you have a hard time breathing. And so to help people get a, uh, an image of that in their mind, the commercial was of this fish out of the water flopping around because it couldn't breathe, saying that's what it's like to have asthma. But that's also what it's like to be human now. A fish out of the water can't act naturally. It, has a, it just struggles to, to be. And if our natural environment is to be saturated and filled and surrounded by the, the, the intimate presence of God, and that was lost because of human sin, then human nature is no longer what it once was. And what happens after the first chapters of Genesis? We see a world that's ugly, distorted, broken. All the people are like fish out of water. They're not acting like they should act because their human nature isn't what it should be because it's broken by sin. We saw that just a few days ago in New Zealand. You just think, how, who in the world could someone go around and brutally murder children, women, in cold blood? But that's the world we live in, an ugly, distorted, brutal world. And Paul is saying, there are people who don't want to do the hard work of dying daily. Because if you're really going to experience the Christian life and know the joy of a changed life, it's going to be painful, my friends. But remember what it said, for the joy set before him, the joy on the other side. What's on the other side of the cross? A different life. Resurrection. And so like Paul, or like Jesus, for the joy set before us, Lent is calling us to take up our cross daily and die to our way of doing it. And say, Lord Jesus, I want to live for you today, even if that means that I have to struggle against something that just seems so natural to me. It seems like that's my very orientation of being, but I'm dying to it because I don't trust that my human nature can be trusted. I trust the human nature that you say I could have if I would die to myself and arise by faith to a new life. Which brings me to my last point. They were resisting the cross of Jesus. His, they were not friends of him because of his death and because of their own resisting that as the means by which to grow. But they were also in wanting to avoid the cross of persecution, of being singled out. As, because if you begin to live in a different way, in the way that the rest of the world does, they're going to begin to single you out and come after you. And that's precisely, Paul could talk like that because he knew. He says in 2 Corinthians 11, five times I was whipped 39 times. Think about that. Jesus was whipped one time that many times. 
Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, I was whipped 39 times, five times. Three times they bent me over on my back, took off my shirt, and caned me with rods. Once I was pelted with rocks, and they thought they'd killed me, and they left me for dead. And then now he's in an imprisonment. And one of the interesting things, the pillar commentary was the best commentary on this text for today, because what it says is that the language Paul is using here is he's using language that is subverting the Roman order or the cultural order that was opposing him. Here's what that, that text says, that when Jesus said, or in the Roman Empire, Caesar Augustus was acclaimed to be, quote, savior of the world. By applying this title to Jesus Christ, Paul explicitly and deliberately speaks of Jesus in language which echoes and hence deeply subverts language in common use among Roman imperial subjects to Caesar. What he's saying is, is the world is saying, get in line. Get in line with Caesar or you end up on a cross. But I'm telling you, the real Savior that you should be following, no matter what happens to you, is the man Jesus, because he's the true Savior. And then he says, why? He says, Paul again echoes the claims of Caesar. The Roman emperors claim absolute power over the bodies of their subjects. The Roman emperor claimed absolute power. If they want to take you and pin you to a cross, you're their subject. They have the right to do it. But Paul says, only Christ has the power to bring everything under his control. Remember that was verse 21. Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under control. You see what he's saying? He's, he's saying, don't be afraid of the current culture you live in. And if they're telling you that you need to think this way, you need to act this way, you need to get in line with what we're doing in the 21st century because we've got the power or we've got the influence or we've got the, the numbers behind us, Paul says, no, the one you want to follow, the one who has the real power, because he proved it by being raised the third day, he's the one you want to follow. And he goes on to say, only Christ has the power to bring everything under his control. The power of earthly tyrants to humiliate the followers of Christ will be overthrown by Christ when he subjects all things to himself and transforms our bodies of humiliation to be like his glorious body. Christ, not Caesar, not America in the 21st century, not American culture, not Western society, nobody else will exercise the power to transform our bodies. And our ultimate allegiance is not to the time in which we live. To have the approval of those people. Because to want their approval is to live as an enemy of the cross. Because if you're going to follow Jesus, it means your time, your people, your culture will want to crucify you. And Paul says your allegiance should be to the only one who should, has the real power over your body to transform it if it should die into his glorious body. And so Paul went willingly to die and be beheaded by his culture of his day because he had entrusted... It's in Philippians where he says, I know whom I've believed in, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him. He's saying, if I die, I die. He said that in Romans. Whether I live or whether I die, I belong to the Lord. Christ, not Caesar, will exercise his power to transform our bodies so that our humiliation will be transformed into glory. In his exercise of power to control all things, Christ will display the sovereign power of God. That's why he says there's coming a day, it's in Philippians chapter 2, when every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. And to live as a friend of the cross is to willingly suffer persecution for him. Because you're saying, I'm looking to him. I'm not looking to the time in which I live and to the approval of the people around me. I'm looking to him because he alone is worthy of that kind of, of looking to. He alone has the power to transform this lowly body of mine to be like his. And when it does, he does, I'll have that spiritual body that is fully animated and under the influence of his spirit and only then in eternity will I really know what it means to be human. Because right now we're like that fish out of water. We're not in the Garden of Eden. And we're not in heaven. To the degree we experience the Spirit, that's the degree to which we know. That's why Paul says that's the, the foretaste, or the book of Hebrews says in chapter 6. It's a, it's a preview of the coming event. Of when we're liberated and really know what it's like to be a child of God. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, we thank you. 
for the cross of Christ. For it's by that cross and all that he suffered that we've been given the gift of eternal life. We thank you for the cross of Christ. For it's through that cross that we, we begin the transformation process as we die daily to the things in our lives that are not from you. We thank you for the cross of Christ. For when the world persecutes us, we remember that Jesus said, Blessed are you when you are persecuted because of me. That ours is the kingdom of heaven. It belongs to us. We pray all these things, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. With those who are able to stand as we sing our hymn of consecration, number 593, Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow. Mm -hmm. 